You've probably seen from a lot of my content this year that I'm rather taken by the new wave of gaming laptops that blur the lines between portable, take-anywhere PC gaming and high-performance desktops. We've reached the point now where the CPU and uh, GPU silicon inside a laptop is essentially identical to the equivalent chips in a desktop PC. And uh, now a similar convergence is happening in the specification of laptop displays too. So this is the Razorblade 15 Advanced. It's a 15 inch thin and light notebook and astonishingly it ships with a 300 hertz screen. So zero compromise there, it's the state of the art. In this video brought to you by Digital Foundry and Nvidia, we're gonna look at this technology and what it can actually deliver in this portable form factor. We'll be breaking out our 1000 frames per second high speed camera to capture and quantify the 300 hertz gaming experience. And we'll be trying to figure out, well, what can you actually do with a 300 hertz display in a laptop? I mean, that level of refresh rate, you know, it's just kind of nuts, isn't it? So before we go on, let's uh, kick off with some notes about the Razorblade 15 Advanced first of all. I mean, it's rather beautiful, isn't it? What you're getting is an Apple style unibody aluminium frame with dimensions broadly in line with the excellent Dell XPS 15. And this is pretty impressive, bearing in mind that the XPS in particular is thermally constrained with a less powerful GTX 1650 GPU. The Razer is packing the same CPU architecture, a GPU with hardware accelerated ray tracing, no less. But look, this is all about hardware specification, right? We're looking at an Intel CPU here, the new Core i7-10875H with eight physical cores and 16 threads. This is paired up with an RTX 2070 Super Max-Q with eight gigabytes of GDDR6 VRAM. So of course, that's Turing architecture on a 12 nanometer die, 2560 CUDA cores, 320 tensor cores and 40 RT cores. Now, I'm still kind of blown away by the concept of hardware accelerated ray tracing working on a laptop, but there it is, running Remedies Control with the full RT suite at 1080p resolution, accelerated via DLSS AI upscaling. It's worth remembering that DLSS typically works with ray tracing disabled too. And in actual fact, with Death Stranding, this machine runs the game maxed on DLSS quality mode at between 105 to around 165 frames per second, to the point where I actually think we're CPU limited here, believe it or not. We'll quantify these components against desktop equivalents a bit later on in the video, but what sets this laptop apart from any other, and indeed pretty much any traditional desktop monitor, is that 300 hertz refresh. So yes, if you can run a game, at up to 300 frames per second, this display will resolve every single pixel rendered by the GPU. Typically, the fastest desktop displays at the moment max out at 240 frames per second, so there is an advantage there. Now, what's brilliant about the PC space is the constant pushing back of boundaries and the vast range of different components tailored towards different audiences. So to put it clearly, a 300 Hertz screen is not for everyone. So the Razer Blade 15 can also be configured with a 60 Hertz 4K OLED screen, which better suits different content. AAA games, for example. To my mind, once you move beyond 120 frames per second, you're entering eSports territory in terms of the best actual application of the technology. And that's gonna be our focus for the most part in this video. So with that in mind, a while back, I produced a video focusing on the tangible benefits of moving beyond a traditional 60 Hertz display, going all the way up to the latest and greatest at the time, 240 Hertz. I used a Sony RX100 Mark V to film the screen in action in slow motion pretty much the only way to capture all of the advantages of a high refresh rate display. So you see, using slow motion photography, we can see every individual refresh of the display. Let's quickly recap what I discovered there before moving on to the Razorblade 15's 300 Hertz screen and what that additional 60 Hertz brings to the table. So up until fairly recently, a monitor upgrade has been defined by, well, the size of the screen, obviously, but 
Primarily it's physical resolution, the amount of pixels. So it could go from 1080p to 1440p to 4K. Easy to understand, right? Extra pixels adds extra clarity and things generally look prettier. But moving beyond 60 frames per second adds temporal resolution. More detail in time, if you like. Once you reach a certain point in screen resolution, temporal resolution starts to become a lot more important for a huge amount of reasons. First of all, high refresh rates uh, mesh perfectly with an input system as precise as keyboard and mouse. Well, the mouse specifically. Um, with the slow motion photography here, you can see that the basic idea of moving the mouse pointer shows the extra precision you get with this input control system married up to a higher refresh rate display. So that test was carried out using an Acer XB252Q 240Hz desktop screen. The Razer screen supports 60Hz, 240Hz and 300Hz and I've repeated the same test again. All of the benefits you saw previously are exactly the same, except now it's in a laptop, which is amazing. 240Hz versus 300Hz difficult to quantify the difference there, but we shall attempt to do so a bit later on. Now, we're going to be talking more in depth about gaming performance, of course, but essentially you're going to want to be able to run titles at extremely high frame rates to get the most out of a screen as fast as this one. So Counter-Strike Global Offensive, it is one of the big esports titles and it can indeed run at incredible speeds, so it's a good example of showing the benefits. And of course, it has a replay system so we can rerun the exact same content at different refresh rates and frame rates and compare them with our high speed filming. 60 Hz, 144 Hz are the most popular refresh rates in today's displays. The leap from 60 to 144 is immense, obviously. I mean, you can see it straight off the bat. Animation is smoother because you're getting more temporal resolution. You'll see enemies more quickly because the visual response is faster. And because you're getting more precision from the mouse, you can track targets more easily. And equally as crucial, because the game is running at a higher frame rate, the time taken from making a movement or pulling a trigger and seeing that movement or seeing that shot fired significantly reduces. And that's just moving from 60 hertz to 144, going from 144 to 240, latency, input lag, well, obviously that's reduced still further. So the question is this, does all of this translate to the Razer screen as well? And what boost does 300Hz give you over 240? Now, let's look at our CSGO clips again on the three supported refresh rates. Obviously, 60Hz, 60 frames per second, it's light years behind, no doubt about it. It's a shame that 144Hz isn't natively supported on the screen, and uh, 240 and 300Hz have very similar looking fluidity we're seeing that the desktop experience has indeed translated to the laptop, but 300 hertz even in slow motion. Kind of difficult to differentiate versus 240. If we go in really close on our slow motion shots, typically you'll see an extra frame of ghosting caught by the high speed camera at 240 hertz, simply because the image is persisting for longer and the high speed camera is able to detect that. Interesting scenario though, right? I mean, we're generating an extra 60 frames per second. You will get lower latency, you will get uh, less ghosting, but compare and contrast against a 30 FPS versus 60 FPS comparison. There's only a 30 frames per second advantage here, yet the difference is night and day. So this is why it's important to decouple frame rate from the actual time each frame is displayed before it's replaced with the next frame persistence, if you like, or frame time. So check this out. It's a graph that maps display refresh rate up against frame persistence in milliseconds. We start at console quality 30 frames per second and scale up to 360 frames per second. Now, ASUS has an amazing looking screen coming up soon that's going to support that. The Razer Blade 15 Advance tucks in just below that. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is that we don't perceive time by frame rates, we perceive it by, well, time. And in this case, we're measuring it by milliseconds. Low refresh rates are obviously bad because we're only getting a screen update at 33 milliseconds at 30 frames per second, and then 16 to 17 milliseconds at 60 FPS. But it's still a gargantuan boost. 
Now 144 frames per second I've said in the past is the sweet spot for a display for AAA gaming. You can enjoy high physical resolution and still get a big big improvement in update speed. Almost 10 milliseconds locked off the frame time. But the higher you push refresh rates, actual image update improvements are more difficult for the human eye to discern. The Razer's 300Hz screen updates every 3.3 milliseconds. But let's say, for example, a notional 1000Hz screen appeared. Now that sounds absolutely amazing. It's generating over three times the frame rate. But the frame time improvement per frame would only be 2.33 milliseconds. So some might say it's the textbook definition of diminishing returns. So why is it valuable? Why do people want these super fast displays? Well, I'd say it's valuable in the same way that, say, Formula One drivers competing for pole position are separated by mere fractions of a second in their lap times, and why the teams are looking for any competitive edge. This philosophy translates over directly to eSports. If you consider how the F1 teams invest so much, not just in the driver, but also in each individual component within the car, well, that maps over to eSports as well. Subtleties in mouse and keyboard design, the specs of the host PC, and yes, of course, crucially, the end point of the whole experience, the display. And with that, we emerge from the display discussion and talk about the rest of the Razorblade 15's hardware specification in a bit more depth because, um, well, fundamentally, we've got a 300 Hertz 1080p screen here, but we need to get those pixels to the screen in the first place, right? Let's begin by quantifying what the laptop specs can deliver in desktop terms. You see, the Core i7 CPU and the RTX 2070 Super GPU may well be identical at the silicon level to desktop parts, but necessarily they need to run with a much lower power limit. As well, you can't fit desktop level cooling into a thin and light notebook. Clock speeds must go down. GPU-wise, things can get a little confusing. We have an RTX 2070 Super Max-Q here, but different Max-Q parts run with different power limits. Performance, fundamentally, is what matters. I'm not going to bore you with the percentage differentials here, as the graphing is remarkably straightforward. I benched at 1440p to effectively remove the CPU as the bottleneck. Looking at Far Cry 5, the Razer is just a touch slower than a desktop RTX 2060, while switching over to The Witcher 3, it's at more of a midpoint between the 2060 and 2070. Crisis 3 essentially sees the Razer's GPU entirely on par with the 2060. So I would rate this as preferable overall to a desktop 2060, even though performance looks quite similar, simply because you're getting an extra 2 gigabytes of video memory, and in that sense, it's more future-proof. Uh, the CPU side of the equation is a little bit more challenging to quantify because comparisons to desktop chips vary according to the workload. So here's Ashes of the Singularity CPU test, which is representative of very heavy RTS gameplay and stresses all cores and all threads. This brings clock speeds down. So the 10875H delivers 76% of the performance of a Core i9-9900K and 91% of the performance of a Core i5-10600K at stock speeds. AMD's Ryzen 9 4900HS in the ASUS Zephyrus G14 is essentially on par when you look at the result at the end of the benchmark, but as you can see, in context, the Ryzen 9 and the Core i7 are kind of jostling for position. Compare and contrast with Far Cry 5 running an engine that's dominated by single core performance. Now the 10875H is 25% faster than Ryzen 4000. You're still getting 76% of the performance of the 9900K and 81% of the 10600K. Our final test game here, Crisis 3, utilizes all cores, but it's not quite as heavy on threading as Ashes of the Singularity. The 10875H has a 19% lead over Ryzen 4000 and delivers 75% of 9900K performance, rising to 82% over 10600K. Interesting to see Ryzen 4000 beaten, but do bear in mind the AMD chip is running with a tighter power budget. Meanwhile, 75% or thereabouts of the performance of the astonishingly fast Core i9-9900K is pretty impressive for a laptop. So how does all of this performance translate into the eSports experience? I asked my hashtag friend and colleague Will Judd, who primarily plays eSports, 
to give the Razer a go on a range of titles and to report back. Well, whatever game you're looking to run, getting a sustained 300 frames per second is going to be really difficult uh, to the point of being impossible in many cases. The workloads of game logic and rendering adjust according to how much is going on at any given point. In CSGO, for example, uh, with VSync off and mostly low settings, we measured between 180 to 350 frames per second, averaging out in the mid 200s, and that was our best result. Now that might sound like an enormous variance, but remember that at the extremes like this, frame rate as a measurement is less important versus actual per frame persistence, the frame time. So the variance is actually uh, 2.9 to 5.5 milliseconds, averaging out at 4 milliseconds, which doesn't sound quite so insane. Clearly, a high refresh rate display works here, and there is a clear benefit over something like, say, a 144Hz alternative. We gave Valorant a go, the new game from Riot. It's a newer title, it's heavier than CSGO, but it still delivers anything between 130 to 250 frames per second. Now this is actually on high settings. You can go to low, uh, but you do lose a fair amount of graphical bling and you only gain 20 frames per second. Anyway, to put that into perspective, that's a 4 to 7.7 .7 millisecond frame time window. And again, a high refresh rate screen in excess of 144 hertz will deliver benefits. We also took a look at another eSports favorite, Overwatch. Low settings at 1080p offers up 150 to 200 frames per second, depending on content, while whacking everything up to ultra, essentially lops 50 FPS off the frame rate overall. Again, there are benefits from the 300Hz display, uh, but you're not maxing it out, if you will. And more advanced engines will push hardware even further. Call of Duty Warzone, for example, even on low settings, takes us into 110 to 130 frames per second territory. 7.7 .7 to 9 milliseconds in terms of that frame time window. We can improve performance to 150 FPS or thereabouts by dropping resolution uh, using the resolution scaling slider to 67%. So this kind of demonstrates that we are GPU limited. But we are effectively rendering at 720p here, and this presents readability issues tracking targets at a distance. Now the Razer does also ship with an RTX 2080 Super Max Q GPU option, faster than the 2070 Super Max Q we've got in our model here. So there is the opportunity to do better here, to get more out of that 300Hz screen in GPU-bound scenarios. Summing up then, just because you have a 300Hz screen, this doesn't necessarily mean you'll be running every game at 300 frames per second. You simply have a screen that's capable of delivering all of those rendered pixels up to that point. And yes, eSports titles are the main beneficiaries of super high refresh rate displays. Now, will we ever see AAA fare break free of the more typical 120 to 150 FPS limit? It's going to require a step change in how these engines are built to overcome CPU rather than GPU limitations. And yeah, I think CPU is actually the primary limitation. I mean, consider this. We live in a world now where crisis can run on a handheld. As good an example as any of how well GPUs can scale. CPUs? It's a lot more difficult, but there is some promising work to look at. We have to scale back resolution and GPU settings, but Doom Eternal demonstrates that a new approach to threading can yield substantial benefits. And it's really easy to get this game running faster than 200 frames per second, which is pretty amazing. Fundamentally though, when we consider that frame rate versus frame time graph, I do wonder whether the AAA game will progress beyond that 150 frames per second barrier. But in the here and now, eSports, that's where it's at. That's where you're going to get the maximum benefit from a high refresh rate display like this. So there we go then, the Razer Blade 15 Advanced. I should point out that in common with most gaming laptops, the CPU temperatures can get toasty. I noticed them in the 80s, Will got it as high as the 90s in fact. This makes fan noise an issue, but fundamentally this is a fully viable, super powerful games machine with a state-of-the-art display that eclipses performance from pretty much the best of the best in the desktop space, at least until the ASUS 360Hz display arrives.
My only issues with the screen are that it's fairly dim by high-end laptop standards. And that kind of tends to happen when you're pumping out this super high refresh. And in its quest to deliver ultimate refresh rates, there does seem to be no room for G-Sync here. But the fact that a 300 Hz laptop display even exists, that it's an option, I think it's remarkable and I love it simply because it's a celebration of the plurality of PC hardware. And in this case, high-end eSports on a laptop, clearly it can work. But that's all from me for now. Uh, like, subscribe, share if you enjoyed the content and there is that bell. It's there to be rung and doing so grants you the power of instant notifications whenever we post new content. But that is all from me for now. Thanks for watching.